I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This time we'd like to invite you to sit back and enjoy the landing. Signal indication we are bouncing on the surface of Mars. This is a very good sign. Touchdown, signal detected. We're studying the atmosphere of Saturn, the rings, the moons, the magnetic environment, and sending all the data back to Earth. We have seen for the first time that there is material coming off of the surface of the moon and streaming out behind it, and we see that it's forming part of the rings. We're only finding out now how old they are, how young some of them are. Did they come from an old, broken-up satellite? Did they, are they still being regenerated? Why have they lasted so long? So it's really cold and we're seeing a lot of these lakes. It's really the land of lakes, more than Minnesota. The surface temperature on Titan is very, very cold. Water ice is hard as a rock, okay? It's not gonna be a liquid. So we know that water ice is not uh, forming these lakes. However, if you go back to the atmosphere, you have natural gas, methane. Its properties are just right, the temperatures are just right, that it condenses, forms rivers, and eventually these lakes. Saturn is like the solar system as a whole in miniature. You start to answer questions that we want to know about life on Earth, like how did life start here, how did the solar system form. You can study that on a smaller scale at Saturn. One of the key discoveries that the Cassini orbiter and the Huygens probe revealed for us was discovering the liquid lakes on Titan. Cassini was able to look at the lakes, get a sense of the coarse composition of the lakes, but nothing about the organic molecules that are dissolved in the lakes. The Titan-Saturn system mission is a three-in-one mission with an orbiter for Titan, a balloon that will float through Titan's atmosphere, and a lander that will splash down on one of the northern lakes of Titan. This mission will actually go into a lake, sample the liquid directly, see what the organic molecules are that are present. The Titan-Saturn system mission also will go to Enceladus, the tinier moon, a thousand times smaller than Titan, which has volcanoes, geysers essentially, that are spewing material from the inside of this moon outward. And it's a chance to see whether there might be molecules that would indicate that life has actually formed within the source region of these geysers. These geysers have water ice, and we strongly suspect that there's liquid water in the region that these geysers are coming from. We know there are organic molecules there because they've been measured by Cassini. The ability to follow this up quickly is essential because with Cassini Huygens, we have now trained a generation of scientists who are ready to take a new generation of instruments and capabilities back to Titan and Enceladus and really answer the questions that Cassini Huygens has left for us. And that continuity of, of knowledge and of enthusiasm is essential and very difficult to maintain in the outer solar system because trip times are so long. 
the Titan-Saturn system mission really is Jules Verne realized. It's a kind of planetary exploration that we have never ever done before anywhere else in the solar system and can only be done on Titan. This mission will touch the human heart in terms of the way it's exploring this fascinating world. It will be floating on the surface of a lake. It will be floating through the atmosphere. It will be revealing the entire surface from orbit at the same time. As we think of exploration, of unveiling a new world, it's exploration in the true sense of the word. There is strong evidence now, based upon how Titan radiates energy in the microwave, that the dark areas, and perhaps even most of the surface of Titan, is in fact covered with organic material. The Santa Clarita Valley family of water suppliers encourages you to put your water to work by following these simple tips. Turn off the water while brushing your teeth. Reduce your shower time. Every minute can save up to five gallons. Upgrade to low flow toilets and shower heads. Water your lawn and garden between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Check for leaks in faucets, hoses, and sprinklers. It's that easy. Please visit scvh2o.org for more information. Howdy friends, it's time to dust off your boots and head on over to the city of Santa Clarita's annual Cowboy Festival. The Old West comes alive as you walk down the streets of the Melody Ranch Motion Picture Studio. They'll be non-stop entertainment all weekend with nationally renowned musicians and cowboy poets. Get fitted up with authentic cowboy gear and taste the best cowboy grub in the West. So come on out to the historic Melody Ranch Motion Picture Studio in the rustic hills of Santa Clarita. Hi, this is Louis Gossett Jr., and you're watching SCV-TV, the Santa Clarita Valley Television, right here. Hello, my name is Curtis Wilkerson, and I am a quality assurance engineer for the Mars Science Laboratory rover. And this is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Spacecraft Assembly Facility. This is literally where it all comes together. Come on, let's go inside. When we're building a spacecraft, all of its parts are brought here to the clean room for final assembly. So why do we use a clean room? Because dust particles and other microscopic contaminants can harm our sensitive equipment and optics. So we have to remove those particles from the air. Also, tiny airborne life forms 
called microbes coexist with us. We have to remove those as well, because we don't want to visit another planet and think we've discovered life just to find out we brought it with us from Earth. This clean room is configured as a class 10,000 clean room. That means that within one cubic foot of air, there can be no more than 10,000 particles the size of half of a micron. Half of a micron is 200 times smaller than the width of a human hair. Now if 10,000 sounds like a lot, by comparison, the room that we're standing in has nearly 500,000 to a million particles within one cubic foot that are larger than half a micron. So where do all these particles come from? Well, most of them come from us, the people. Things like skin flakes, our hair, cosmetics, even the lint on our clothes. When we're standing still, motionless, we shed more than 100,000 particles per minute. We're also worried about triboelectric charging. Now that's just a fancy way of saying static electricity. You know how it feels when you're walking along a carpet and you touch a doorknob and you get that little shock? Well, that is more than 2,000 volts of electricity. That kind of shock can do a lot of damage to our electronics and sensitive equipment. So to prevent static electricity and contamination, we wear a special clean room garment you may have noticed. We call it a bunny suit. Come on, let's suit up. Inside the clean room, the air is kept clean by a special ventilation system. On this side of the room, air is blown in while existing air is sucked out on the north side of the room. It's then recirculated through HEPA filters and carbon filters before being blown back into the clean room. We also move our heavy equipment with large cranes. The crane above us has a capacity of 15 tons. Inside the clean room, we're building the Mars Science Laboratory, the next rover going to Mars. We have four large components in here today. Behind me is the back shell. During our 10-month cruise, this will be the home of our rover. It's covered in a white thermal protection system right now to protect it during entry into the planet. Here we have the descent stage. Some call it the sky crane. After we detach from the parachute, this has the responsibility of lowering the rover with the help of eight retro rockets seen in red to a soft landing on the surface of Mars. At nearly 16 feet in diameter, our cruise stage gets us from Earth to Mars. With solar panels on the top, we have power, antennas pointing towards Earth, we have communication, and with the little rockets in the corner in red, we can make small trajectory maneuvers during our cruise. And here's the reason we're going to Mars, the Mars Science Laboratory rover, the largest rover this planet has ever sent to Mars. It's mid-October, and right now we're doing a lot of electrical testing, but the closer we get to our launch date, we'll start adding our wheels and our masks with the cameras, and then the robotic arm. They'll really start to take form. Once we're finished with all our assembly and tests, we'll pack it up and ship it to Cape Canaveral, Florida at Kennedy Space Center. We'll go through even more tests before we stack it on a rocket and launch it to Mars. I gotta get back to work, but I hope you enjoyed your tour from NASA and JPL. I'm Curtis Wilkinson. We have the Axel rover. This is a new rover concept that we've been studying in collaboration with Caltech to try to provide mobility for very challenging high-risk terrains. The best way to think about this rover is think of a yo-yo. By reeling and unreeling its own tether that it carries with it, it's able to lower itself over any type of terrain. Actually, in fact, it doesn't need any terrain. This can be lowered from a balloon. That presents a lot of unique and interesting challenges that no one's really ever thought of before in terms of the type of tether to use, the material, how to like reduce abrasions, and how to get over rocks without getting the tether tangled. This robot has met and exceeded all of my expectations just in terms of the way that it's performed going down 90 degree slopes, traversing to flat ground, and getting over rocks and, and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's been great. Right now, it's really risky for astronauts or robots, for example, like the Spirit and Opportunity, to go into craters. The ground is too loose and the slopes are too steep. 
so it's too risky for those robots to get into those craters and perform any interesting science. So this robot would be very useful for those types of scenarios where it can really dive into those craters, pick up some samples and really analyze them and tell us something really new and interesting about Mars or the Moon, for example. I just saw these two really strange men and they reminded me so much of your cousins. Maxine and Stephanie? They reminded you of Maxine and Stephanie? Well, yeah, except they were both men. Well, I can't believe that there would be more than two people who look like Maxine and Stephanie. You know, I think they said something about a play called Leading Ladies. Oh, isn't that playing at the Canyon Theater Guild in Old Town New Hall? Oh, yeah, you, I think so. From now until April 25th. Are these strange men in the play? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I guess we'll have to see for ourselves. <laughs> Leading ladies at the Canyon Theater Guild. It's hilarious. What's up for April? Did you know you can see other galaxies through modest telescopes or binoculars? Well, you can. Hello and welcome. I'm Jane Houston Jones at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. During 2009, we're celebrating International Year of Astronomy by taking you on a tour of one of the month's best celestial objects. This month, it's the Whirlpool Galaxy. Join me as we step away from our solar system look beyond our own galaxy and view the spiral arms of another galaxy. Because we are inside our own galaxy, about two-thirds of the way from the galactic core, we can't see the whole thing. But we can see the spiral arms and so we know we live in a spiral-shaped galaxy. Early astronomers looked up in the night sky and saw patches of light which appeared like faraway clouds. They called these patches nebulae. In 1845, Ireland's third Earl of Ross, William Parsons, used his huge telescope at Burr Castle in the center of Ireland to observe and sketch the spiral structure of the Whirlpool Galaxy. Other 18th and 19th century astronomers, including father and son William and John Herschel, noted the structure of this galaxy too. A galaxy is an enormous collection of gas and stars held together by gravity. Since the 19th century, astronomers have aimed telescopes at galaxies, discovering their composition. In the 20th century, NASA's orbiting telescopes have looked at this amazing galaxy to see it in many portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio to infrared, on to visible light, and past visible to ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope looks at galaxies in the infrared part of the spectrum. It can see long lanes in spiral arms. They are stars and gas laced with dust. The Hubble Space Telescope sees similar views in a different wavelength. It looks at the optical part of the spectrum, or what we think of as visible light. That's the light we can see. NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory reveals black holes, neutron stars, and a glow between the stars of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And last but not least, the GALAX telescope shows that hot young stars produce a lot of ultraviolet energy. Don't forget to view Saturn this month either. It's higher in the sky and easier to see. You can read all about the Whirlpool and other galaxies in the distant universe this month on NASA's International Year of Astronomy website, astronomy2009.nasa.gov. And you can learn all about NASA's missions at www.nasa.gov. That's all for this month. I'm Jane Houston Jones.
piece of the moon. And bottle 16, unfortunately. Starbase Atlantics. Are you familiar with it? She's going to give you a few words on what it is. It's an organization for young children to help them develop. I thought that perhaps having this lunar sample here for the young boys and girls coming through the museum and to see what we are trying to accomplish here at Patuxent River will give them the inspiration perhaps to follow a career in, in the Navy or as a naval aviators or perhaps as test pilots and perhaps even going into space as I did way back in, in those days. And so today I'm really happy to be able to present this moon rock, which tonight I will formally present it to Admiral Eggert uh, and to be representative of the some 30-some astronauts, I believe, or naval aviators who became astronauts, came through here and were successful in our space program. Captain Lovell has selected the Patuxent River Naval Air Museum to be the lone recipient of NASA's prestigious Ambassador of Exploration Award. This is a priceless piece of another world. Jim Lovell was on the first crew to spend an extended time in space. Two weeks in a bucket seat next to a West Point guy. <laughs> Sharing air, food, sea stories, whatever the Army equivalent of sea stories is. And he also was the first crew on the first crew to rendezvous in space with another spacecraft the first to leave Earth's gravity and the first to travel to the moon. He also became the first person to travel to the moon twice and he was the first American to fly in space four times. The second member of the Gemini 7 team will be James A. Lovell. Until his piloting assignment, astronaut Lovell was responsible for monitoring the design of spacesuits and developing techniques for lunar and Earth landings and recovery. Here, the two men prepare to rehearse getting out of Gemini at sea. When they actually fly the long orbital mission, extensive medical data will be gathered. Included are experiments on the effects of weightlessness, in-flight sleep analysis, and many more. As though he were sitting in the graduate stack studying. And Command Pilot Lovell brought Gemini 12 to a station-keeping position at Tananarive. Three hours, 46 minutes after liftoff. Belongs to Gemini 12 and its crew. We must not stint them. These men set out to do a job and finish that job, thumbs up. Command pilot and pilot had added five hours, 28 minutes of EVA exposure to the Gemini record. Each established his own individual record. Jim Lovell has flown longer in space than any other man, 18 days. 14 days on Gemini 7, four days just behind him. Apollo 8, history's first manned flight to the vicinity of another celestial body. Next up, in April 1970, Apollo 13. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. Uh, you, can, you can always use them if you have to. Two days into the mission, an oxygen tank exploded in the command service module. The crew faced the prospect of slow suffocation. At 141 hours, 30 minutes, ground the last time. But using the reserves of oxygen in the lunar module, and with that module as their lifeboat, they were able to return safely to Earth. Everyone enjoys live music and great food, and there's plenty of both at Jazz Night at Vincenzo's Pizza in Saga. The Saga's High Jazz Band is performing plenty of jazz favorites with some good old rock and roll mixed in, too. Come support the band. A portion of every dollar spent at Vincenzo's on Jazz Night goes directly to the Saga's High Band Program. It all happens on the second Wednesday of every month from now through May. Bring the family and enjoy the fun. The show starts at 6.30. 
without sign language, some of these children would go home to a quiet, silent house. Even though there's lots of communication happening, they wouldn't know what's going on. These parents are dedicated to preserving their family and keeping their deaf child within their own family. And to do that, they come to all these classes faithfully and, and learn the language. As many of the parents here today, I was in their shoes 22 years ago. You find out your child is deaf and you just don't know what to do, where do you go, what do we do? It's so wonderful to see so many families being involved in um, a deaf child's life. My friends and their brothers and sisters and my parents, they don't know how to sign. So they come here to the sign language class. Well, my mom and dad, they really try and they practice a lot. And so I tell them they need to come to the class to sign. And I help them a lot at home too. They're happy, they're um, visiting with friends and it's really nice because when you're deaf, you may be the only person for days that's deaf. And you haven't seen another person for maybe two weeks. I mean, that's how it was, and it's very isolating. You're just alone on this little island, so it's so wonderful to see so many deaf in this area now. 29 years ago, I might have one or two families where a parent, a parent, could sign. Now every family has someone that can sign. And partly that's because of this school's commitment to provide sign language instruction to the parents. Wedding chimes, you, you know they'll bring happy times. I was strolling out one evening, lovely evening by, by the silvery, silvery moon. I could hear somebody, singing, somebody singing a tune, a familiar tune, familiar tune. So I stopped a while to listen. Not a word I wanted to miss. It was just somebody serenading something like this. My little Mandy, listen here, there's a minister handy. And it sure would be dandy, just dandy, just great. If you'd let him make a fee, if you'd let him make a fee. So don't you linger, come along, here's a ring for your finger, isn't it a humdinger, come along and let the wedding chimes bring happy times for Mandy and me, my little Mandy, come along, come along, there's a minister handy, there's a minister handy, it'll be dandy, if we let him make a fee, if we let him make a fee, so don't you come along, come along. Here's a ring for your finger. Here's a ring for your finger. Isn't it a humdinger? What a humdinger. Come along and let the wedding chimes bring real happy times for Mandy. My little Mandy and Mandy and me. Mandy and me. My little Mandy and me. Did you know the first gold in California was discovered right here in the Santa Cruz Valley, long before Sutter's Mill? Did you know our valley was the birthplace of the California oil industry? Did you know that when Los Angeles joined the rest of the country by rail, the tracks came together in Santa Clarita? You might know we're a popular location for filming, but did you know we always have been? Learn all about Santa Clarita's fascinating history at scvhistory.com or visit the Saugus Train Station Museum in Old Town Newhall, weekends 1 to 4.